Good evening, everyone. I'm Joanne Curry. I'm Vice President External Relations at Simon Fraser University. And I'd like to start by recognizing that, uh, acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations on whose traditional territories we're privileged to live, work, play, and learn. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first lecture in the President's Faculty Lecture Series for 2016-2017. And thank you for joining us what promises to be an hour of big ideas. I'm sure many of you know that we have our, our mission to be Canada's engaged university and this type of faculty lecture series is a signature part of our vision. By providing opportunities to hear from SFU's leading research faculty, the lectures are designed to foster enlightenment and also to promote dialogue and discussion on important issues of public interest. There's going to be a chance to raise questions or offer comments after the lecture and we also uh, invite you to stay on to a reception or to get hors d'oeuvres and appetizers right now. Please note that this lecture is going to be filmed and it will appear on SFU's YouTube channel. So now it gives my pleasure to introduce Dr. Majid Barami who's a professor in the School of Mechatronic Systems Engineering at SFU and a Canada Research Chair in Alternative Energy Conversion Systems. Before completing his PhD, Dr. Barani practiced for five years in the HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration industry as a thermal engineer and as a consultant. From 2006 to 2008, he was assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Victoria. And at SFU, he founded the Laboratory of Alternative Energy Conversion, LAEC, a state-of-the-art lab located at our beautiful Surrey campus. His research group studies and develops clean and sustainable energy projects, such as fuel cells, refrigeration, and microelectronics cooling technologies. And his team works with several major industrial partners, including Mercedes-Benz, Ballard Power Systems, Alpha Technologies and Automobile Fuel Cell Corp, just to name a few. Uh, his award-winning innovations are potential game changers uh, in the field of clean technology. And in 2016, in recognition of this, he was awarded Canada's Clean 50 uh, to be part of Clean 50 in the category of research and development. Dr. Barami has brought examples of his work with him here today, and I know we're very excited to hear his presentation called putting waste heat to work, the future of clean technologies, and he tells me he's going to do it all without showing a single equation. Uh, so we'll see if he holds true to his word. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Barami. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a uh, kind introduction, hey. Joanne. And thank you very much for coming. I know you are busy, and I hope that uh, this is a time, uh, uh, this is a worth, uh, worthwhile of your time. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, President, uh, President Andrew Peters, for his uh, introduction, kind introduction and invitation for this talk, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the President's office staff, uh, Ms. Uh, Heather, Heather is actually right there. Uh, she's been the, the force behind all that, putting together the, uh, the event tonight. So uh, today, as Joanne mentioned, I'm going to share with you some of the ideas and the research that we do in the lab and um, hopefully uh, leave you with uh, uh, some knowledge about the thing that we can do to make our uh, planet uh, sustainable and our economies thriving. So the topic of the talk is putting waste heat to work and uh, I'd like to call it the future of clean technology. Uh, I'd like to start with some statistics to paint a picture. Uh, the UN, the United Nations, predict the population of the planet will surpass 8.5 billion by year 2030 and 10 billion by year 2050. That uh, fast-paced growth of population coupled with uh, man-made uh, environmental pollution, uh, whether uh, the air pollution, uh, water system pollution, soil pollution combined with uh, climate change, extreme weather, puts a tremendous stress on the resources of our planet. As a result, providing clean water, clean food, and sustainable energy is now a uh, global priority. Um, in the next 40-45 minutes, I'm going to show you some statistics, 
some images uh, and share with you the, the vision that we have to help alleviate some of these issues and some of these solutions. But before doing that, I want to share with you uh, my story, my personal story. Why am I doing this? Uh, so, first and foremost, I'm a uh, proud father of two beautiful children. Sophie, who is uh, four and a half year old, and Damon, who is a year and a half old, year old. Uh, I came to Canada in the uh, end of 1999, uh, uh, did a PhD in the University of Waterloo, and I started working on uh, these topics. I came from a country called Iran. I'm sure you guys heard about this, it's in the Middle East. And uh, I actually saw firsthand uh, the devastation, that reforestation, the uh, deforestation, environmental impact, and drought can have on people's life. Uh, so a lot of people are going through a lot of issues. I'm sure you guys seen the last few years, mass migrations uh, from the Middle East and North Africa to Europe. Uh, these issues are not local issues, these are global issues. And in that, this, this, these are going to affect all of us. So for me as a father and as a citizen, this is a privilege to work on these issues. And I hope that you guys share these with me. And I appreciate that these are, uh, for me, this is not a, another research pro project or to get more funding or to receive accolade. Uh, this is a very dear and near uh, topic to my heart, and I'm hoping that our research, which is a collective research of many wonderful PhD students, graduate, undergraduate students, and postdoc who are, who are working with me in the lab, <coughs> doing all these things, uh, have an impact. So with that, um, I'm going to start this. Um, so I sort of mentioned uh, the issues with uh, planet in flux. I'm going to talk about some, give you some statistics on water. In the 20th uh, century, the population grew threefold. So we have 300% more population on the planet, but we are using sixfold, sixfold water. So not only we have three times the people as a result of, environment, as a result of industrial change and cultural uh, shift that we have, everybody on average uses, uses twice as much water. Again, that coupled with climate change, global warming, deforestation creates a perfect storm. Um, we are also polluting the water resources that we have. Um, the river system, this picture actually shows you the uh, a rivers, uh, a river in China, which is one of the uh, dirtiest river system on the planet. Um, this picture here shows the Euphrates River in Iraq. This picture is a satellite picture to, on September 7, 2006. This is the, pic, the same location, more or less the same day, 2009. You can clearly see how fast the uh, uh, river systems are gone. They're basically uh, changes that are man-made changes uh, due to global warming, uh, longer uh, dry season, and uh, overuse of uh, water systems. Uh, this is not only the issue with the quantity of water, but also the quality of water. This picture is a very famous picture. I'm sure most of you guys have seen it. In uh, last year's uh, disaster in Flint, Michigan. This is in the uh, United States. Um, the water system um, in, in the city got uh, polluted and people got really sick. So um, the message here is not only we have we are facing issues with uh, Quantity of, uh, qu uh, yeah, quantity of water, but also there are issues with the quality of water. So, the UN predicts 48 countries are going to face serious water uh, ch shortages, and the World Economic Forum in 20, uh, 2015 identified freshwater resources as the number one uh, uh, risk facing the uh, econ economy and environment uh, for the world. I'm sure you guys heard of the term uh, climate refugee, and you've seen it in movies and pictures, footage that came from the, uh, from the Middle East, the people passing um, the Mediterranean Sea uh, in flocks. 
so this is mostly related to uh, water issues, clean food, and sustainable jobs. They all have roots and they are highly connected. So again, this actually goes back to issues in the developing countries that we need to, uh, we need to take it seriously because this is going to affect us if we do not take these issues and resolve them. Um, but this is not only related to developing countries in the North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, I actually visited, uh, we don't have to go far to see, uh, to, to actually face these challenges. Uh, last spring I visited a uh, First Nation Reserve in BC and I first, I actually saw it first and I was shocked and uh, puzzled to see such uh, basic needs uh, 200 kilometers uh, north of Vancouver. So these issues are not limited to the third world and developing countries. Here in North America, uh, we also have uh, uh, very serious issues. So energy and uh, global warming, uh, climate change are highly uh, connected. One issue that is often overlooked is the need for uh, the air conditioning and the energy uh, consumptions uh, due to air conditioning refrigeration systems. To put things in perspective, Air conditioning refrigeration are uh, responsible up for up to 15% of the electricity that we uh, produce globally. One five. So it's a huge amount of electricity that goes to air conditioning and refrigeration system. Uh, to show you as an example, I uh, listed some statistics here. Uh, on average, uh, two thirds. Uh, th th these 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 are statistics uh, uh, for uh, yeah 2014. They change a little bit, but this gives you a picture. Uh, almost 20, uh, two thirds of United States home have air conditioning systems, um, and air conditioning for homes is account uh, is uh, consumes about five percent of electricity produced in U.S. and that's uh, 11 billion dollars a year cost of electricity. 100 million tons of CO2 per year is uh, rejected because of air conditioning in houses. That is two tons of CO2 per year per home for air conditioning. Um, the alarming statistics is actually that, uh, is that in the next 20, year, 20 years or so, the need for cooling is going to uh, explode tenfold. And more interestingly, uh, the need in China uh, the, the, the electricity consumed for air conditioning is going to surpass the United States by year 2025. This picture here shows a condo in China and uh, again this is a vicious cycle. Uh, the global warming climate change uh, means higher temperature, higher temperature increases the need for air conditioning and air conditioning creates more global warming gases. So that's a vicious cycle. This, this actually is a runaway, runaway train. Um, we can also find traces of uh, major contribution of, um, to, to global warming and climate change in uh, transportation industry. I just picked uh, one category and that's air conditioning in, uh, in automotive application in vehicles. Um, in the United States, on average, they consume uh, for air conditioning. This is the, uh, the, the, the fuel they use for air conditioning of light duty vehicles. About uh, 40 billion years, uh, 40 billion liters a, uh, per year. And on average, they drop between 5 to 6 kilowatt power of a car. Uh, so, uh, and uh, they increase the fuel consumption by 30%, and they actually are uh, responsible for 37% of GHG and emissions of a, of a car. Uh, this is not limited to uh, automotive application. You have uh, air conditioning impact and uh, contributions to GHG in other forms of transportation, uh, ships, trains, and other forms, even airplanes. Um, so again, I just wanted to show you they are connected and then we need to look into um, these needs as a, as a, as a society. Uh, I also want to give some statistics on the energy usage and, G, uh, and GHG emissions for food chain. Um, the food chain and related supply chain are responsible for 30% of the energy consumption uh, on the planet, in the planet. Um, of that, a major chunk of it goes to greenhouses 
and greenhouses are becoming more and more popular because of the, the climate change and extreme weather. We need to grow our food in closed enclosure in greenhouses. Um, so heating in northern climates such as Canada, um, for heating these, um, these greenhouses, their energy consumption between 68, 65 to 85 percent of this energy, uh, the energy consumption is due to heating. This, this plot here shows the population growth in Canada and this is the GHG uh, emission in agriculture. Uh, the interesting thing is they can actually draw, you can fit a line and you see that these two, the population and the GHG emission in agriculture are more or less parallel, so they are linked. Also you can notice that there are some trends you can predict, um, you know, this is the 2008 um, econ economy uh, bust, so they, they are very interesting data you can, you can draw a lot of information, conclude a lot of information from this. Now let me talk about uh, food transport and the GHG. The food that we eat travels on average 2,500 kilometers. There are a lot of discussion on this exact number that may be less, may be more, depending upon where you live and what you eat, but that's, this is just a number. To put things in perspective, I'll put this map here. So 2,500 kilometers is the distance between Vancouver to San Diego. And that requires um, transportation, cooling, and you, can, you have to provide air conditioning. So there's a lot of energy that goes to food transport. And that needs to be accounted in our energy balance and, and carbon footprint. So one promising solution and one factor that we need to consider is local farming, micro agriculture, horticulture, as opposed to creating this tremendous and monstrous uh, poles for agriculture, say, in, in California that feed the entire North, North America. Not only we are concerned about the GHG and the carbon footprint, but what happened if uh, California is drying? What happened if a tsunami hit that? So there would be other issues related to food security and, and, and other I mean, job security and all that. So uh, I'm going to talk about fossil fuel a little bit more, but to, to put things in perspective for greenhouses and, and the food chain, um, almost all of the, the, uh, the energy that is consumed to, uh, to produce our food comes from fossil fuels. Um, now I've got, I'm sure you guys heard that uh, carbon tax is imminent and is coming. Adding carbon tax will increase, uh, the, will, will, will bring uh, higher uh, production costs and will decrease the income of farmers and that we need to deal with. Uh, and this, this plot here shows the uh, total GHG in Canada. The data is a bit old. This is 2000, 2005, 2006, but they, they predicted it. So we are a bit higher than this, this last data. And this is a target that was set in Copenhagen in 2005. So you can imagine with the new uh, uh, restrict uh, uh, target that we have signed in, in Paris last year, we are facing a major gap. So there is a gap between the GHG that we emit and we produce with the, the target that we have. So as a country and as a species on this planet, we need to do something about these GHG emissions and uh, that is a major challenge. Okay, by show of hand, how many of you guys seen the last year Matt Damon movie, The Martians? Good. So I'm going to use that example not to explain a lot about what a closed greenhouse is. Uh, the, so the idea, so one good and one promising solution to solve these issues, the food issue is to build uh, sealed greenhouses. Something similar to what Matt Damon did on, on, on the Martians, on Mars. So the idea is to build these sealed greenhouses to increase the CO2 level and control the temperature humidity at the optimum level. Not only that, but also add supplemental lighting, so to optimize the, uh, the cultivation uh, growth, the growth of the, the product. So there are some, some data available, there have been this, this concept, this, this is an emerging technology, it's been in the market for the last 10 years or so, uh, although not really, it hasn't really cashed on yet. It, um, 
they've seen between, I mean, depending upon the crop, they've seen between 20 to 60 percent uh, increase in production. They maintain the CO2 uh, more or less, at, again, depending upon the, uh, the crop, but somewhere on 1,000 ppm, which is almost three times the level that the, than, that the atmosphere, atmosphere that you and I breathe. This will reduce the water consumption by 40 percent and energy consumption by 60 percent. It will also allow you to grow food anywhere on the planet, regardless of the climate. More importantly, they, they do not really use, need to use pesticides, so the pesticide use will be decreased by 80 percent. That, 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 that is a very good news for our environment because we're not gonna, going to kill bees and um, poison our water resources. In addition to all that, they're getting very in innovative and they're doing aquaponic systems, uh, so growing fish and food together in a vertical, uh, in ver in vertical uh, format. There are lots of very interesting uh, ideas uh, that, is, that, that, that we can use to feed the hungry planet. All right, so I know this looks very complicated, but I promise I'm not going to go through all the detail. I just want to show you um, what we are going to do, what I'm proposing to do, to resolve some of these issues. So this plot shows the basket of energy in the United States. Uh, this will be different from Canada, from Europe, but more or less we're talking in general terms, right? So in the United States, in the year 2014, uh, solar energy was responsible for almost half a percent of energy production. Uh, nuclear for 8.3 percent. Wind, less than 2 percent. Um, geothermal, almost 0.2 percent. Natural gas, 27. Coal, 18 percent. Biomass, almost 5 percent. And petroleum, 35 percent. A couple of things we can, we, can, uh, we can conclude from this. Number one, we still use almost 70 percent, 65 percent. Uh, our, our, our energy comes from, uh, from hydrocarbons, right? From natural gas, coal, and petroleum. Of this energy, almost 40% of it goes to elect electricity con um, uh, generation. And of that, if you add, add these waste heat, these are the, um, the heat that we dump into our uh, rivers, atmosphere, lakes, and the ocean as a result of this electricity production. So if you add these little tiny bits all the way, all the way down, it shows you that about 60% of the energy that we produce or use on the planet is converted to waste heat and is dumped uh, without being used to the ambient. And that's a tremendous amount of energy. So there is, there is some silver lining here. If we can tap into this low-grade heat, Waste, we call it waste heat because this is actually being wasted. We can use that to create, uh, uh, to use that for, uh, to answer our needs for energy, food, and water. So what we are proposing is to use that 100 degrees C or less temperature sources here at the bottom of the pit, of energy basket. Uh, use some innovative heat recovery technology, and one solution, one promising technology is to use sorption technology to create, to use, to provide potable water, clean food, and air conditioning. So I'm not the only one proposing this. This has been uh, discussed at length. There are lots of other great mind, great minded and um, masters doing this or discussing this. Um, what we are doing, again, is, is some bits I'm going to show you today, um, some of the uh, ideas and concepts that can help us uh, alleviate these issues. As an example, I want to show you uh, what happens in your car. Everybody drives a car. Um, if you consider 100%, this is the energy that you have as a potential in the fuel during combustion. Of that, at best, you get 25% energy going through uh, your, this is the effective power for mobility and accessories. Almost 70% of it will be, will be wasted or rejected to the ambient through 
the engine coolant and the exhaust. A portion of that can be used to answer the needs for air conditioning in, in our cars. So almost um, a fraction of this, I can say, uh, a typical car requires between 2 to 3.5 kilowatt uh, cooling power for air conditioning, which is a fraction of, uh, of this. A typical car, to, to put things in perspective, a Toyota Corolla has, uh, pr produces almost 100 kilowatt. So again, it's a small, small fraction. And to show you the impact of this, I can tell you in Canada, we have 20 million vehicles on the road. All right, where do we get waste heat? So I sort of defined waste heat. Waste heat is temperature sources less than 100 degrees C. And I mentioned power plants and condensers in power plants, but there are other sources. I sort of list them down just to give you a better idea of what we are talking about. So obviously, the first suspect is the condenser of a power plant. Um, you can use geothermal sites, solar thermal panels, garbage incinerators, and um, biofuel. So this is actually a very interesting and intriguing uh, topic to use the waste to feed, um, to feed our, our, our power systems and also pr produce water. Uh, more importantly, data centers and IT, as we use internet more and more, there are lots of energy goes to data centers to uh, to provide these services, and this, this is waste heat, so we can use it to, to grow food uh, in greenhouses. All right, so I'm going to share you by vision. I've actually been thinking about this, how to present this, and Timothy, my friend, at the end, at the back of the, uh, the room is, 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 is smiling at this. So we've been thinking about the, the nexus between water and energy for quite some time. Uh, so this is actually, no, you need energy to, to, to treat water. Um, and for food, you need water and energy. So this is basically, basically the, 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 the cornerstone of any sustainable society. Adding to these three, you also have waste. So no matter what you do, even in a farm, you have waste that needs to be dealt with. And um, the, dealing with waste heat in municipalities is a big challenge. So why not use it? So there are technologies now that can convert the waste to biofuel and to electricity or heat. But even those they already have, they also have waste heat that is being dumped to the ambient. So this sort of shows the vision, the whole concept of uh, the connection between water, food, energy, and water. So at the core of it is clean technology and there are so many, many, many uh, research topics and technologies that can be used and should be used to create this, this cycle. The, 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 the reason I like this is this sort of shows you the cycle of life, right? You start from waste to water, energy, and they are connected to food. And this is a natural way of doing things, right? Following the nature. Now, by... by by clean technology, what I'm going to discuss today is related to um, heat recovery and heat exchanger, um, sorption technology, absorption cooling for energy storage and cooling, air conditioning, and some advanced material, uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing in the lab recently to enable us collecting the heat, recovering the heat and water from these uh, waste heat sources. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about waste heat, uh, uh, waste heat driven um, adsorption system and thermal energy storage. This is a project that we've been working on for the last almost five years, four years. The idea is to uh, create cooling from heat, from waste heat. So with that, I'll, uh, how many of you guys, how many Game of Thrones fans we have here? Not many? Okay. So I'm a big uh, Game of Thrones fan. And the, the title of the Game of Thrones is based on that. I sort of, uh, with Claire, uh, our uh, postdoc here, we sort of came up with this. So this is the song of sand, salt, water, and sun. So we like to say that we're going to use, you know, these four basic elements to create cooling effect. So what's adsorption? Adsorption is adhesion of molecules, gas molecules, vapor, liquids, to solids without changing the chemical composition. 
I have some samples here to show you. So these are the, basically the materials that are silica based and salt based. Uh, some of it, I'm sure you guys seen it, uh, the desiccants in your, you know, when you buy a brand new brand, uh, brand new uh, bag or, or suit, you've seen those desiccants. So they, they absorb humidity. The way it works is um, the vapor, uh, these are highly porous solid surfaces. The vapor attaches itself, because this is the material is thirsty, attaches itself to the surface. And during this adsorption, um, the vapor is transformed from, uh, to, to liquid, from vapor to liquid. And as a result of this phase change, a lot of heat is released. So that's an exothermic process. And a thin layer of liquid is formed on the surface. So during this absorption process, you need to cool the surface, cool the material. And then when the material is saturated, you can add heat so you can desorb the surface. So the, the material becomes dry. You dry, you regenerate this. So by this heating and um, heating and reheating and cooling, you can, uh, you can absorb some, some vapor and release it. So these materials, there are quite a few of these um, activated carbon, silica gel, silica gel, and calcium chloride, and, and some other material. The adsorbent, the adsorbates, um, we, are work, we are focusing on water because this is sustainable, but there are other, some, some other adsorbents that can be used. Um, the features of these systems, um, they are va uh, waste heat driven, so you don't need any electricity, so there's no carbon footprint. The material are, there's no moving part, there's no vibration, noise. These are inexpensive and completely environmental friendly. So this is basically a poster boy for sustainability. Um, these are the material you can actually eat. It is not going to harm you. Um, but there are challenges, always challenges in life. Um, so these materials are highly porous. They are by nature um, insulative material. So the whole concept of adsorption is to heat and cool them. So you need to do heat transfer, but the material are insulative material. So heating, cooling is a major challenge. The other challenge is these work in low vacuum. And everybody, anybody who worked uh, with low vacuum technology would attest that this is a major challenge, the ceiling and, and all that. Uh, we also need to work with evaporators that work in low pressure and the existing technology because of low heat transfer rate are bulky and huge and usually not practical. That's why you do not see them uh, at the moment in the market. So one concept that we are proposing is to use adsorption technology for energy, thermal energy storage. If you look at this plot, again, I'm not going to go through all that, but just this is a simple uh, solar gain in a northern, in northern climate. Give you an example for greenhouse application. Um, you need on average a nine megajoule per square meter for a greenhouse heating. And then the total solar irradiation in midday is 10.8 megajoule per uh, square meter. So we have enough solar, solar energy, and this is only during a day. The other thing that you can do, if you can uh, store heat seasonally in long term, you don't even need to burn any uh, fossil fuel to heat your greenhouse or cool it for that matter. So the sun pays for the party. It's just that we don't have the technology to store it and use it. So with this um, adsorption technology, um, we built a prototype in the lab. We have some, um, some small samples to show you. Um, we actually, okay, to, to put into perspective, let me give you ice first. Uh, the energy density, this is the energy storage density versus temperature. So for ice, you would get almost 400. Forget about the, the, the unit and all that. So everybody understands water and ice. So when I, water freezes, you can store almost 400 megajoule per cubic meter of energy in ice at zero degrees C. Using these adsorption system, adsorption material, you can go all the way to 2,000 or 4,000, like order of magnitude more than ice. So there's a tremendous potential to use this material for energy storage. In our preliminary studies in the lab, we built a system that, uh, and we achieved 1.2, 1.1 uh, 
megajoule per of uh, uh, 11, yeah, 1100 megajoule per cubic, uh, cubic meter, which is almost three times than water. The interesting point is not only the energy storage density, but also significant, so there's no significant waste heat. We can store heat in summer and use it in winter without losing much. And there's no degradation, no hysteresis effect. Uh, so this system works based on the idea of using the, the heat from the sun to store the heat and then by introducing some humidity to this, uh, to this material, the heat is released, which, is, which makes it very interesting for many applications. All right, let me talk about the adsorption cooling system and how it works. A uh, typical air conditioning system, the one that you have in your car, in your fridge, uh, has four main components. You have a compressor, that's the big bad boy here that consumes all the electricity. And it does two things. It compresses the, the gas to high pressure, high temperature, and it also sucks the vapor from the evaporator. The high temperature, high pressure gas goes to the condenser, liquefies, expansion valve, evaporator, absorb the heat. This is the thing that you have in your fridge. It works perfectly, very efficient, very reliable. The only issue with this is it uses a lot of electricity. What we are proposing is to use adsorber beds, adsorption technology, to replace the compressor with two adsorber beds. So again, as I mentioned, the adsorber material, adsorption material would absorb the humidity, absorb the vapor from the evaporator, create the suction effect. During that process, we need to cool it with the ambient. When the material becomes saturated, there is no suction, then we shut these valves and we start heating it. When you heat this, you will evaporate the vapor, you create that high pressure effect of the compressor. As I, you can imagine, this is not going to be a continuous process because it's either being absorbed or desorbed. In order to make it a continuous process, you need to have at least two of these beds. So one of them being absorbed, the other one being desorbed. So you can create cooling effect. So uh, it seems very, um, very interesting and uh, somewhat like a science fiction to use waste heat to create cooling, but we've been working on it for the last four years. Um, and other people are also working on it. This, this is not only our lab, but other labs as well. So we, make, we, we came a long way. The very first unit that we built was uh, the, uh, the performance and all that was too bad that I couldn't actually sleep uh, for a couple of nights. We were hoping to get, uh, for the, with the first prototype, to get a, uh, an index, a performance index, up to uh, around 100. We got something around 10. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we couldn't even understand what was the problem. So we spent a lot of time, we banged our head against the wall. Quite a few of our people, are, uh, the, uh, the people in the lab, we tried to understand what went wrong. So this is the result of at least four years research. Um, we now have some, we made great progress. We still, we have a long way to go, but this is actually very promising. Um, one major issue for us, as I mentioned, is the heat transfer to the material, uh, cooling it. Um, so we've been through a variety of heat exchanger types. Um, after going through all that, we realized the, the fin tube is the best way, uh, best type of heat exchanger for our application for now. And then when we built this, we thought, hey, this is done, we're going to have our system working. Then we realized that's not the actual bottleneck. The main bottleneck was the evaporator, because the evaporator works at very low pressure. We are talking almost vacuum pressure. Um, so we've been, again, working on that uh, for quite some time. We got some inspiration from nature. Um, Capillary-assisted evaporator um, is, a, is a term that uh, is coined in the literature. So we are using uh, pipes, especially design pipes. We have some examples here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of these. Um, so we've been through quite a few uh, manufacturers. So they help us. Uh, the problem with this is um, um, nobody really used these pipes for this application, and we are limited to you know, options that are available. Um, so we, we, taught, we worked with two companies, one company in Germany called Willen, and the other one, Wolverine, in the uh, United States. Um, they help us. Um, 
with different, these are microscopic images of these different pipes. You can see there are lots of features on these pipes to, to help the capillary effect on these tubes. Um, we test and we build, uh, this evaporator is one example that I uh, we brought here to show you. Um, this is called capillary assisted low pressure evaporator or CALP for short. Um, so we've been trying different types of evaporate uh, uh, these, pi these pipes. Um, for, for our purpose. We built a test bed in the lab. Uh, we've been trying uh, to, to make this, uh, opt uh, to optimize this process at different, uh, under different operating conditions. Recently, we came up with another idea. Uh, this is actually quite recently, a few months ago. And we, um, we use a, um, a sputtering process uh, to create a metal foam layer on top of this fin tube. Uh, you can see this, if this is the fin type, uh, fin tube before and this is the fin tube after we spray it with copper. This is all to, um, for two reasons, number one is to increase the capillary effect in these pipes and also to increase the surface area by order of magnitude or more to increase the, the heat transfer. Uh, so this is a picture of the evaporator, this is a penny, you can see the size. Okay, this is, this is good news, right? So that's the only plot I'm going to show you. Um, so this is the uncoated evaporator. The, the, the performance was 375 cooling. Uh, this is our uh, cooling power. When we coated it, we got all the way to 700. Almost twice as, uh, twice as much, which is, which is great news. So we, after that, we all went to the pub and had a, had a party. <laughs> Uh, so eventually we're getting to that. So we've been through the first generation, second generation, now the third generation. Very promising news. And this is a picture, microscopic picture of the, the metal foam. So this is the, the actual fin uh, and this is the foam. So the foam is like a, a spongy structure, highly porous open cell made of uh, copper. So this shows the progression of this chiller, this waste heat driven chiller in our lab, uh, started the, the very first prototype, the very first proof of concept. This is the one, first generation, second generation. Uh, recently we tested it uh, and we got from 3 watt per kilogram all the way to 300 something. It's almost two order of magnitude. So you can imagine, we came a long way, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we haven't tested it with the new evaporator, new coated evaporator, so we're hoping to increase this, hopefully to, uh, we're aiming for 700. If we can get to that, this makes it, uh, 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 you know, uh, competing, uh, we can compete with the existing uh, chiller technology for vehicles. Also, we're going to use this waste heat driven cooling system for our water technology that I'm going to talk about right after. Now with that, um, I'm going to switch to, to water. So let me have a sip. Uh, so I'm going to talk about atmospheric water generation and we have a unit there. So I talked about the, the crisis, water crisis on the planet. Everybody pretty much knows this. This is no secret. Um, I, I thought maybe I should give you, re refresh your memory. I'm sure you guys see it in your elementary school, the water cycle. Uh, so the water evaporates from the ocean, we have the cloud, and then rains goes, it comes back to the, na to, to the ocean, um, rivers, lakes, and, and aquifers. To give you some numbers, uh, water sources on the planet, 97% is in the oceans, so too, too saline, you, can really, you cannot drink it. 2% is in polar ice and glaciers, again, unavailable. We only can use almost half a percent of the water resource on planet. So this is the good news. We have a lot of water, we just don't have the technology yet to use them. Um, and the other thing I, I want you guys to notice and, and um, be aware of, and if I can refresh your memory, is that we do not destroy water. We cannot create nor destroy it. We just use it. So water is recycled. And David Suzuki has this saying, he says, um, we're still drinking dinosaur piss. Uh, so this is being recycled. So one source of water, actually all the water comes from the sky. Right? Um, atmosphere contains 12 trillion cubic meter of renewable water. 
So our ancestors dig wells and went to the ground to get water from the ground. If they had the technology, they should have gone drill their holes to the sky and get the water from the sky. And that's the, the, the concept behind <coughs> atmospheric water generation or harvesting. Uh, so that water is available anywhere. When you, whenever you have temperatures above zero degrees C, the ambient or the atmosphere can hold water. And that water is sustainable. So if you withdraw that water or harvest that water, you're not going to dry out the atmosphere. It will be automatically replaced via evaporation from uh, the ocean and, and other places. Um, the, the beauty of this technology is this, this doesn't need access to, to water, to liquid water. You can get it from the air. It's not regulated, um, and I like to call it water democracy. So you're not at the mercy of up the river dam or, or the facilities or pipes or anything else. You can have your little or small facility to collect water from air. Um, it is a scalable, so there is no limit on how much water you can harvest from atmosphere. And using these machines, you can also get heating and cooling as byproduct. That's not the whole story. Uh, so atmospheric water generation has been around, they've been around for quite some time. Um, the, the basic of it is fairly simple, it's basically is an air conditioner. I'm sure you notice that in a hot, humid day, you see a stream of water coming from your air conditioner, right? In your car or in the air conditioner, the water comes out in hot, sunny days. Um, but the issue with this, this technology is the cost at the moment. One of the major issues. So it's like 30 times the desalination technology in terms of operating cost. There are issues with desalination technology. There are pros and cons for both. But this is a very energy intense technology. The conventional technology, the conventional atmospheric water generators are effective only in tropical climate, hot, humid climate like uh, Florida, uh, Hawaii and those places where the humidity is high, temperature is always above zero. Uh, in climate even like Vancouver, these machines do not work year round. In fall and in winter they stop working, even in the spring. Um, more importantly, they stop working in hot and dry climate. Ironically, you need water most in those climates. So in the lab, we've been working on this for a few years now, and we came up with, with this concept, uh, with this idea, uh, maybe we like to call it hybrid atmospheric water generation. Um, the idea is to uh, pre-process the air and create our Florida climate, as opposed to uh, having it in Arizona or, or Manitoba or even British Columbia. So the, this machine, this hybrid atmospheric water generation will pre-process a lot of air. We're using adsorption technology. Uh, we store the humidity and then the humidity and the temperature of the stream that goes to our machine is much higher, almost five times, between three to five times higher than the ambient. So we can harvest water uh, easier. Um, the, the other thing is this machine runs on waste heat, so there is no need for electricity, and there is no environmental impact. So unlike desalination technology or other technologies that membrane based that uh, use uh, saline water, and they need to return very high concentration salt water back into the uh, into the uh, um, to the ocean that damages the uh, marine uh, ecosystem. This technology does not have any side effect. So we started with building a uh, proof of concept. We can see that uh, this is a schematic of it. We went upward. There is no specific scientific or engineering reason behind it. Uh, we didn't have a space. So our lab was crowded. We just went up, upward to, to accommodate the need. Recently, we got a better lab. So hopefully, the next prototype, we don't need to do that. We built it uh, like two, three years now. Three years ago, you see this is a fairly crude proof of concept demonstration, uh, plywood, you know, foam, a spray foam, duct tape. So engineers at work. Whenever you see duct tapes, a bunch of engineers are working. And it worked. It gave us, um, showed, showed, showed that this technology works. 
Then we build the second generation. You can see it here. Um, this is a small demonstration that we can move it around. Um, I'm going to turn it on for now uh, to show you how it works. This system uses electricity for now. Um, but we are working on another, uh, the next generation of this as we speak. This is a, a small unit that produces harvest between 19 to 38 liters per day water from the air. Uh, let, me, let me do the demonstration. I like to do that. Um, so this is the water. This, is, this, this machine has been working since afternoon, so it has some water in it. Um, Drink a little bit. Hmm? Yeah, you should. Uh, so this uh, this water is after we harvest the water from the air. Let me just turn it off. Um, there are several filtration. So we 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 also have a UV filter to kill the bacteria. So the water is very clean. In fact, is doesn't that doesn't have any um, any minerals. So for you to live on this water, we need to add some minerals and remineralize the water. Uh, as I mentioned, we are at the moment uh, working on a larger scale uh, waste heat driven system. Uh, and we like to, and we're going to install it in the city of Surrey. They have a greenhouse. They were gracious enough to give us um, the opportunity to run the machine and then showcase it uh, in their greenhouse. So I talk about um, air conditioning and energy, talk about water, and I've been talking about waste heat all the time. I didn't tell you how we are going to get the waste heat. Uh, so one issue, one, the biggest piece of the puzzle remaining now is how do we harvest this waste heat? How do we ac access that? Um, so waste heat, uh, waste and waste, uh, heat and water recovery from flue gas um, has, been, has been discussed for many, many years. So there's no secret that the, uh, the flue gas that goes out of the exhaust has a lot of energy, a lot of water. Uh, in fact, um, almost 11% of the flue gas that goes out of your exhaust is water. For every, uh, if you guys remember of chemistry, elementary chemistry, you burn uh, uh, methane, CH4, for every mole of CH4, you get two moles of water. So you have a lot of water. And considering the fact is that almost 66% of global electricity is generated by burning fossil fuels, we are pumping a lot of water into the atmosphere through uh, uh, the flue gas. But um, flue gas is a corrosive environment. They have a variety of acids and because of the water and heat. Um, this is fairly expensive and costly to harvest that heat and water. And that's why we haven't really seen that technology. Uh, the other reason is the, uh, the fuel has been so cheap. So as we get into the eras that uh, there's carbon tax and the environmental issues become uh, the center of discussions, these technologies become more and more um, interesting and at the center of the attention. So uh, we've been working on uh, an interesting um, new heat family of heat exchangers. Again, I have some samples here to show you and I uh, encourage you to come and see it after uh, the talk. Um, these are graphite heat exchangers. They're fairly light. Um, this is actually lighter than aluminum. Um, Canada is the fifth largest exporter of the raw graphite. So we're exporting this to China and other countries, United States. They use them for many, many applications, from gaskets in, in the engine to uh, batteries and all that. Um, so graphite has very interesting features. They have, uh, you know, graphite is another form of diamond, right? So diamond has the highest thermal conductivity of, on the planet. Um, so graphite has interesting features. They do not corrode. So they're highly corrosive, uh, the highly corrosion resistance, and that's the feature that caught our attention. So we are teaming up with a local company here to create these uh, graphite heat exchangers. Um, we are actually very, very excited. And last few weeks, uh, we built the very first uh, graphite heat exchanger here. 
this can um, exchange heat via graphite. This is made in Canada. Um, this is a, another form of heat exchanger that we, we are building in the lab. Um, we are going to use this to harvest heat and water uh, from flue gas. Uh, so the feature that, um, again, the graphite, graphite heat exchanger exists in, uh, in the market. You can actually go and buy them, but they're fairly expensive because the, the type of graphite that they use is powder-based graphite. So they use powder graphite, mix it with some binder, create these blocks, and they machine it. Versus our technology, we're using a different manufacturing process. Uh, this is called roll embossing. And, and this can be done in mass production levels and the cost is fairly low. It's uh, actually um, comparable in terms of cost with the aluminum heat exchanger manufacturing processes. But still there are lots of challenges. We need to deal with the brittle structure um, and there are some issues with low thermal conductivity in in-plane direction and there are possibility for erosion. So we're still not we haven't still solved the entire uh, issues with this. We're still working on it. Hopefully, in the next, uh, next few years, uh, we will have some interesting things to show you. What do you mean by heat uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Just, just give me a second. Before I forget, I want to show you these heat sinks made from graphite. Um, these are fairly light. They can be used in corrosive environment. This is comparable to this aluminum graphite. This is built using, um, I believe, casting or machining. I guess we, we, we machined it, Martin, right? So this is machined, but they usually use it use die casting. With in-plane, I mean, if you consider this graphite sheet, this is in-plane going in the plane. If you have a graphite sheet, this is in-plane direction, this is true plane. So um, if you open back of your cell phone, uh, almost all of them have this graphite sheet that uh, they use it as a heat spreader. So the heat is spread through that. Even this laptop has a graphite heat, a heat spreader. So the heat from CPU and, and uh, batteries and other component, electronic components is spread through graphite. As soon as the heat gets into graphite, um, the in-plane conductivity is huge. So it spreads the heat. But true plane is low because graphite is a layered, uh, uh, layered microstructure. You can actually see it here. The difference between graphite and, and diamond is this. So diamond has high thermal conductivity in all directions versus graphite has high thermal conductivity in plane, but not so good in true plane. Did I answer your question? Sure. Good. Um, this is the other graphite heat exchanger that I mentioned. So this is specifically designed as a proof of concept demonstration for, uh, uh, for heat recovery, water recovery from flue gas. Um, hopefully we, we, can, we can start testing these soon. So, um, again, the idea is to recover water and heat from flue gas. So we discussed that. All right, so I'm gonna stop here, give you if you do not want to see me again, or you do not invite me again for the next talk, I want you to leave with these, these messages. These are some food for thought. These are the things that I thought about it. So to make this a bit more, to give you some, some ideas. So water and energy crisis will get worse in the near future. New policies and innovations are crucial. So I'm talking to my VP here. So they need to do something at the university level, politicians at the higher level. We need to adapt to new climate, new uh, extreme weather patterns, and water shortages. They are here to stay. We made a lot of damage to the environment, and we need to deal with it. Innovation in sustainable water energy system has been modest, and that's an understatement. We're still using the same refrigeration technology that was, in, that was used in back in 1950s, even 1940s. We changed the gizmos a little bit, your fridge, can talk to you, it can text you, the thing that you need, but still the core of it, although improved a little bit, but hasn't dramatically changed. I want to give you an example. I like this example. In the last 10 years, I mean, I grew up with these old rotary phones, right? Uh, landlines. 
in the last, in last five years or so, last ten years, five years, the smartphone has changed the way we, we communicate and changed the entire telecommunication and communication industry. This is the type of transformative change that we need to aim for in order to answer the, the crises that we are facing. That kind of innovation is needed. We are at that point that we really need to do something. So we need to set uh, realistic but ambition, ambitious goals to deal with these uh, crises that we are facing. We need to think multidisciplinary. If I only think I'm a mechanical engineer by training, if I only think mechanical engineering system, cannot really do much. So we need to think of combination of energy, material, manufacturing, food, and other things to, to, become, to, to, to be able to do something and also bring optimization, IT, big data, and other, um, other forms of, uh, other, other schools of science into this um, to these, uh, clean technology. Sustainability requires integration, integration, integrated solutions. I gave you some examples of places that we have wasted plenty of it. In fact, any power generation plant, we are dumping more energy that we need to feed that city as waste heat. Why not build our <coughs> greenhouses or farms near that to harvest that waste heat to feed the city? Right? So we need to think of these uh, integration, integrated solutions to, to cover the entire aspects of our society, of a society from waste to food to water to energy. And these are all connected. You remember uh, Fight Club, the movie, right? The, the, the list, you do not talk about Fight Club. So this is, this is the thing. There is no silver bullet for these technologies. There is no single technology that can answer all these needs. We need to, we need to think of basket of solutions. We require a variety of different things to come together from material science, uh, and, and any other, many other forms for, for forming these clean solutions. The scalability is a major challenge. So when we, when we think of selecting a technology, we need to, to look into how scalable the technology is and to find the proper, proper uh, um, location for that to optimize our systems. So one thing that I, I worry is that sustainable energy and climate change and removing our um, carbon footprint has been looked at as a burden. We are taxing it. I think this is the wrong way to look at it. We should think of it as an opportunity. These jobs, you cannot lose them. You cannot outsource it to China or India or any other place. Every society needs these jobs. These are opportunities for growth. Uh, these transformative, this transformative technology requires investing more. So we need to invest more in clean solutions. We need more funding. I'm again talking to my VP. Uh, th that we can, we can sort of get away not to rely on high hydrocarbon sources. We need to shift, uh, from, uh, shift energy consumption toward the clean sources. We also need to look into different uh, ways to increase our efficiencies. There are very low, sp small things that we can do, low-hanging fruits. Use better insulation. Change the lighting to LEDs. Uh, drive, you know, use public transportation and all that. So we need to look into the, 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 whole, the whole system to increase the energy efficiency. <coughs> Last but not the least, we need to do pilot studies. We need to put things, these, these uh, ideas, these concepts in solution, in practice, and learn from them. And that requires, again, I'm going to be saying that funding uh, in universities. Yeah, polit any politicians here? No. Uh, all right. Um, with that, I'll stop. I just want to thank, uh, thank uh, our team at uh, the lab. Uh, some of them are here. Um, this work, uh, the work that I presented is the collective uh, effort of many highly talented graduate students, PhD students, undergraduate students, and postdocs, lab engineers. And I'm blessed uh, to have uh, these 
ladies and gentlemen uh, working with me. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Barami, for a fascinating equation-free lecture. I think it was an excellent uh, articulation of the challenges we face today and will face increasingly in the future. And thank you for sharing your, your research uh, that's you. in progress. Uh, we've got some time for a couple of questions or comments from, from, from you. Um, we have someone, where is Joey? With a microphone, uh, because we are taping it. And we have our first question right here. Oh, you don't have a microphone? Oh, I, can, I can speak loud. Oh, are these the microphones we're talking? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really exciting uh, and a very uh, thrilling combination of technologies to um, put forward solutions. Now, I'm a water person. Uh, I work with the uh, Pacific Water Research Center at Simon Fraser University. So my question is water oriented and at the moment we know that uh, a lot of people are looking at desalination as, as a solution to tap into some of that 97% of saline water. Uh, particularly in places like California after the uh, drought last year for example there was a lot of push. The technology you're presenting you said is about 30 times more expensive at the moment. So can I ask you to look in the crystal ball? Uh, say five years from now or ten years from now, do you think that the price will actually match or be lower than desalination? Because that would be really the revolution uh, that, that, that we're looking for to actually uh, solve a lot of the water problems, not just in places like California, but really around the world. I think there's a huge sort of pent up demand for, for that. So if you can sure, build that, uh, <coughs> that technology, everyone yeah. will beat down your doorstep. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. To summarize the question, I believe the question is, uh, at the moment, the operating cost of this technology is 30 times the desalination water. Why not just do the desalination? Or can we predict the water, the cost of operation cost of these machines come down in the next five, 10 years? Um, I want to answer this. This is a very good question. This is a question I get quite a bit. So I'm actually, I have exercise, I can, I can answer that. Uh, yeah, there are two things I want to discuss. Number one is, as I mentioned, we are not looking for a silver bullet. There would be a basket of solution. So there would be places that desalination is the answer. If you're in the vicinity of the ocean or, or, a, or a sea, and you have the technology, the infrastructure, hey, that's, that's, a, that's the best technology to go. You need to build those. as the state of California just spent a billion dollars on that desalination um, facility in near San Francisco area. Um, but again, if you are 50 miles or so inland, you need to pump the seawater to that facility. In some places you don't even have that luxury, so there is no uh, you know, liquid water. So there are, there are niche areas that atmospheric water is the answer, if it works. And again, I'd say that with a big emphasis, because the conventional technology does not work year round. So with this change, with this innovation, I believe this works. We can, we can use it, we showed it in the lab, that this works under different climates. More importantly, as for that 30 times the cost, um, this machine, if it works with waste heat, there is no operating cost. Basically, if you use the waste heat from uh, a power plant or, or from the sun, that issue is resolved, so we can use it. Um, the, only, the only remaining cost is the capital cost. Uh, again, there would be discussions, there would be, um, there would be um, scale, because that 30, 30 times lower, lower price comes with a hefty initial cost, so you have to have a major facility installed, versus these machines are not that expensive. Uh, they work as... Um, at a smaller scale and the price become comparable. Again, if you're feeding a city, probably, and you have access to, to seawater, that's probably the way to go. Versus if you have a ranch or if you have a community or you're building a greenhouse somewhere and you need to manage your water, um, feed a, a village, for example, and you don't have 
the manpower to maintain a membrane-based technology and all those issues, perhaps this is the solution. Again, uh, this actually, this te atmospheric water technology has been um, identified by IEEE as one of the seven transformative technology of, of the next century. I hope I answered your question. Any more questions? Uh, we'll take that one and that one, and then we're probably going to break. So, uh. Hi, I, um, I enjoyed the work you did, especially uh, your work on um, the, uh, the, the coolants. Uh, and I just had a question in regards to uh, the system that you designed. Uh, it seemed a little bit bulky from what I could see compared to what we're familiar. Is it, uh, it going to be used for uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, another group in Italy is working on the same project, and they had this project with Fiat. They wanted to showcase that adsorption cooling system works for vehicles. The first attempt, in their first attempt, they used the entire trunk of the vehicle just to showcase it. So the existing systems are large, bulky, as I mentioned. And the reason that you see this bulky system and this big evaporator here, these are lab demonstrations is still at the early, early stage, pre-commercialization. We're still doing research on this. So hopefully when we get there, when we have the technology ready, these can be compacted to a point that has become competitive with the existing technology. Yes, it still is bulky, but we are working towards that. This, this is still in the... Um, the research phase. And the existing technology is not really useful for, we cannot use it for, for cars or even houses. Uh, these are uh, mainly at the, ex I mean, at the, the one that is available in the market. They are um, only useful at the huge, huge capacities and in places where uh, uh, clean technology is incentivized, like Germany and, and Japan and Europe. Even in Canada, but I only know uh, UBC recently installed a small one. And that's the university again, just doing it for mostly for research. Hopefully for us, if you new campus uh, in Surrey, we will install one of these uh, just for the fun of it. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have this gentleman at the front. Hi, I can, I can talk without it. Uh, Majid, on behalf of NRCIR, we've been enjoying funding this HAW Gen uh, project. But my question is different, you know, on the, uh, for the um, heating of energy storage, thermal mm -hmm. energy storage application. As a homeowner in Burnaby, and I understand I can use this sorb sorption materials to dry them in, in summer and yeah. then wet them and so liberate the energy. What, you know, how, how big inventory of, of, of this silica gel or modified mm -hmm. silica gel do I have to have? Yeah? And is there enough of sunlight on an average year that I can actually capture enough energy to last me through the, through the cold months? You know, have you done any mm -hmm. kind of calculations on this? And thank you very much for a great question. I have a PhD student who's working on it, me and I are sitting right there. Uh, yes, we're still at the earlier stage. Um, there are other groups working on this topic. Um, I believe there is enough energy over the year, actually more than that. Um, so there are issues like real estate. How much space you can give me in your house for us to install this? Um, still, the, uh, the techno-economical aspect of it, we haven't done it yet. Uh, so we, we, we built a very small prototype in the lab. And this, we got very promising result. Um, we, this actually surpassed any phase change uh, thermal energy storage system by a factor of two. Um, again, it's very, very promising. We are all excited. Um, the challenges are twofold. Uh, number one, again, it's at the end of the day, uh, we need to commercialize it. And I've been doing this for last year or so. That's, that's another story altogether. So if you have something very good working in the lab, it's one thing, bringing it to a market, to the market, is a whole different story. Um, but with this technology, you need to, um, to inject water. And that's why this is different. Versus other technology, other and thermal energy storage, 
uh, you store it in, in terms of, you know, basically in a high temperature source or in a um, phase change form that you lose, the, you lose the heat to the ambient. We call it self-discharge factor. This does not have it. So there are pros and cons. Um, hopefully soon we'll have a large, larger scale demonstration to beta test it because you do, it, you do the testing in the lab is one thing, doing it in, in the actual real world is another story. Um, but again, looking into um, the whole building envelope, um, I believe we need not only need to look into thermal energy storage, but we, only, we need to look into windows. Insulation is a big chunk of uh, the equation. And if you, again, look at the, the entire system, the cycle, I believe we can do it. It's just a matter of uh, as soon as the carbon tax is introduced and becomes more expensive, people uh, feel the pain, they start looking into innovative solutions, and the, if the government sets the priorities right, um, like what they're doing in, in Europe, especially in Germany, I believe these things become economically viable. I will let you know, hopefully soon. Great, thank you, Dr. Burhami. And you're gonna stay on sure, for yeah. several minutes. We're having a bit of a reception here, so no one has to run off. I'd like to thank everyone for the very good questions and all of you for coming. I'd encourage you to check out the SFU Public Square website. There's a lot more <coughs> events and activities and lectures. The next lecture in the series is being held at our Harbor Center campus in Vancouver, and it will be Assistant Physics Professor Stephanie Simmons talking about the international race for the quantum computer. So it'll be another fascinating presentation. So please, thank you again. Please stay on and enjoy the refreshments. There's still several rum balls left, I'm told. So. Yeah. <laughs>